Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's my pleasure to be here today. And uh, this is a new topic we are researching right now at the university, which is um, what is going to happen with uh, journalists in the near future. It's okay. I will show you a short introduction and let me, let me know your opinion. Can you trust what you see? How do you know that these people speaking today is Obama or is not Obama? Can you? Probably not. That's a, that's a big question. So what I'm going to explain today is what is happening in the process of uh, doing journalism, which are the main consequences. And I have some data, maybe they are interesting. For instance, how much does it cost? Because it's amazing. What, how much do you think it costs a robot journalist for one week, for one month, sorry, what's the fee? 1,000, 2,000, 10,000, 50,000. If you want to have a robot journalist in your school here, to promote the school, you have to pay about 3,000 euros per month to write 20,000 pieces of uh, journalism, 20,000. I think it's, it's good, it's a very good price. So, uh, so forget all what you know about journalists because everything is changing. And this is a, a very interesting question because uh, Artificial intelligence is transforming the production, the broadcasting, and also the consumption of journalism. And nothing will be again as it was. It was an excellent time to, to be a reporter, to have your newspapers, but right now, everything is uh, modeling a new uh, type of uh, information. That's very, very relevant in terms of international information. <laughs> We have data from China, from Latin America, Germany, uh, France, Sweden, of course, Associated Press, UK, um, the US, Xinhua. In all the countries you can imagine, there are a lot of projects doing artificial intelligence and journalists. I don't know if you know it, but probably you are reading it. Do you support any sport? Not Champions League, not, not nothing top in, the, in your country? Do you support any second class club? Do you? Because I support one. Probably this information is made by a robot, not by a journalist. All the information you need is made by a robot. And do you, um, do you have money? Probably not, because if you are journalists or professors, you have no, not too much money. But if you have money and you have investments, do you think that the information you read is made by a robot or by a journalist?
What do you think? In our research, probably this information from financial statements and so on is made by a robot, not by a journalist. So, the first issue I would like to explain is that uh, artificial intelligence is about a culture. It's not a technology, it's not a tool, it's a way of changing everything. It, it connects software and hardware. It affects the machine learning, it affects the comput computational um, uh, activities and everything who is connected to journalists. So if you switch off your mobile, as everyone, at 6 o'clock a.m., what, what is going to happen today? Let me check my agenda, let me, let me check headlines. This is also selected by a robot, not by a journalist. So this is, a, this is the territory we are uh, facing right now. So do you think that you can make a difference in between a text written by a journalist and a text written by a um, robot? Can you? Is that just no question? Can you? Probably not. Probably not. It depends. It, if it is a simple activity, like uh, who wins yesterday in the match, a simple activity if the, the, the stock market is growing or not, you will never know if it is a, a robot or um, a journalist. It is connected also with the consumption and the rights of the consumers, because do you have the right to know that this information is not made by a journalist? Because we have a lot of more examples about this. These are the, the, the current risks we are uh, identifying right now. The first one is about if you want to increase the volume of your business, you are, you are, what you are going to do is to increase the commercial journalists, not the public service journalists. So we have discussed today at the coffee, if you want click paid, the robot is your best option because he can write about 20,000 pieces every day. So every week, sorry. So you cannot compete with this. I don't know if um, most of media companies in Europe understand that journalism is not about commercial journalism, it's not about how to compete with Google, but how to compete, how to offer a best service uh, for my audience. This is the first risk. The second one is that all the infrastructures who are connected or developing artificial intelligence has a private interest. That's not so bad, but the question is, can we maintain a certain public service media connected to this robot journalist? Is it possible? Is it desirable? I don't know. The third question is about the, uh, the journalists have a, as a profession. If you have to pay one journalist to write, I don't know, two, three, five pieces every week, or if you have to pay one robot to write 20,000 every week, what will you decide? What do you think? Will you pay for 50, 60, 70 journalists or only for one robot? At the moment, it, it, that, uh, this uh, precarity is not happening by the moment because uh, they need some journalists in the newsroom in order to, um, to make it more um, sexy, if you want to say that, the information. But all this low cost and this, all this clickbait information is made by robots without any doubt. So uh, regarding the um, conscience or the ethics, do you think that this is a human text? Do you read a text? Is, 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 it is relevant if this text is made by a journalist, a human, I mean, or a robot? Is it relevant in order to understand better uh, the ethics, the problems, the social approach, the behavior? Because by now, by today, uh, artificial intelligence does not have ethics by now. 
connected to this uh, human text, of course, we have a certain human context, which is the power of the programmers. So the power is switching from journalists, from the newsrooms, to the programmers. They have a different view of the world, a different view of the, uh, of the reality. And if you are interested in, there are about 20% of women in programming and 80% of men. Probably that's a problem. Also, if you go to the American schools, because you have uh, more data from there, uh, there's no Afro-Americans doing programming. There's no women. Uh, so all, all the programmers in coming from Silicon Valley and so on and all these topics come from India, and they are men. Do you think that's a problem? We have some experiments with uh, Alexa. No? Do you have Alexa at home? No? No. If you have children, maybe it's not the best option. Because most of the answers are uh, thought by a programmer who, has probably, who is probably a man up in his 20s. And if you make some questions, uh, he has no answer. Because half percent of the population is out. So it's a very interesting experiment about this. So, of course, technology is not neutral. Uh, if you decide to invest in technology, it, it means that you are uh, deciding if you want to operate in an open technology, in a closed technology, in a private infrastructure, in a public infrastructure. It's not neutral, and we have to consider it. So. This is a very interesting um, letter to the FT director. It is uh, about one year ago, more or less. So, can you read it? The topic is more or less. I am a black man, I read FT every day, and I have to, to explain to you, Mr. Lionel Barber, that there's, there are no black men as columnists in your newspaper. Is that the global view you have? This is happening also in, interna in artificial intelligence. The answers, the questions, the, the way we work is connected to men, not to women, to men from certain parts of uh, the US, also from India, but for instance, Europe is not competing, not at all. So, so uh, nothing is too bad, of course. So we have a lot of opportunities and we can uh, consider that artificial intelligence is a create opportunity to do different things. So, if I don't have to do this uh, stock change uh, information, this low cost uh, information, I can do different things. If I can, if I can develop my own personal style, if I can be a journalist, a real journalist, I have an opportunity, and also probably the most relevant one is this contextual journalist, which is the, uh, okay, I have a lot of information every 30 seconds. If you want to know the last uh, data about whatever, you can do it. But can you give me an explanation on why is that happening? Can you give me a historical perspective on why this uh, former minister is now in the opposition and why this political party is relevant in this country or not, can you give me some context? By today, the robot cannot do that. By today. So this is a huge opportunity to have more creativity oriented to context, not to the information. To explain the causations and the correlations in certain facts, and to forget about data, because uh, data will be provided by the machine. I'm completely sure. So, uh, everything, everything that is not mechanical will be an opportunity for journalists. Think about all the things we know now, and we didn't know, I don't know, one year ago, two years ago. Think about Donald Trump, Brexit, uh, the Colombian referendum, um, the question of Catalonia and Spain, all the things that we don't know what is going to happen. <coughs> Think about today, China and, and Trump commercial war. 
you will need a journalist to explain uh, scenarios, to explain consequences, to explain the psychological um, activities of Donald Trump, of uh, Jeremy Hunt, of Boris Johnson, or whatever. So this is the, the, the two big opportunities, context, contextual journalists and no mechanical information. So there is no chance to, to go back. Do you, do you know this? Do you know what this is? Don't panic and carry a towel. Do you know this? Do you remember that? No? Oh, sorry. That's probably because you are uh, about uh, 40 years old, more or less, because this was a very famous science fiction uh, book in the 70s. If you ask it, uh, if you ask to the new generations about robots, Instagram, social media, they are not considering a digital on-off activity. Everything is connected. So the question with our generation is that we consider that robot journalist is not truly journalist because it is not done by a journalist and you can never trust a, a robot. For new generation, this is not discussion. There's no, this is not relevant. They are consuming, they are producing, they are sharing information, it doesn't matter if it is made by a journalist, if it comes from a media company, or if it is come from an influencer or, or whatever. So um, we analyze it, an uh, um, artificial intelligence company in Spain, and they explain it to us how to do this in the field of journalists. This is very, very interesting because they have a lot of clients coming from everywhere, from Spain, but also from the US, UK, and also from Qatar. This is a very interesting topic. Do you know why? Because in a world of trust, do you trust the reports you find in the web? Do you trust? I'm looking for information about Qatar financial services. Who has done these reports? These reports are made by robots, but this is Spanish robots. Uh, using official information from the government of Qatar. Do you think you can trust this financial information? Do you think that these data are truth or not? It's not, it's, it's not, uh, it's not a minor question because in, in my view, if uh, these uh, robots can improve the SEO and can put the information in Google better than the competitors, you will have um, you will have propaganda, but it seems it is journalism. So it's a, a very good question for us. So more or less, the, before, before uh, the robot writes the first uh, news piece, they, have, uh, they read about 10,000 pieces of information before the first one in terms of if, if we are focusing in sports. Before they write the first piece in financial information, they will read about 50,000 pieces. Now a question to you. Do you think that my undergraduates will read 50,000 pieces of information before they get the, the bachelor? How much time do they need? So. So they, ha they have about, right now, 10 million of examples of news in the world. So doing that, they can more or less know very well the automatic writing. That's the reason why you cannot, um, you cannot know, you, you will never know if this uh, piece of information is written by a robot or by, or by a journalist. The second issue is to, um, sorry, to design the content. To do that, what they do is to uh, write all these 10 million information pieces every day and uh, to check the agenda. So doing so, they can uh, focus in all the global issues they consider they are relevant, reading Financial Times, Le Monde, The Guardian, all, all you can imagine. So uh, after this, they will send the information to a journalist, and the journalist can more or less select and choose which are the most relevant and which are not. This is the machine learning process, because 
they will do it uh, the first time, the second time, the third time, but after 10, 12, 20 times, the machine is doing better than the editor-in-chief. So that's a big problem. Uh, then, finally, what they do is to match text, video, content, and everything. And finally, what they do is this making the difference is as far as they have different clients but in the same market, what they do is to, uh, to increase the combination, so not the, not the same picture for the same clients, not the same text for the same clients. So this is a real personalization of information for each client. So this is, a, this is not a robot for everything, which is also, a, that's making also a difference because if you are connected to the newswire, like um, as I said, the press, they will give you only one information for all the clients. This company, what they offer is different information for different clients. So, what is the problem with uh, uh, artificial intelligent journalists? So, they are not original. They cannot do anything connected to creativity. And they cannot um, give to them what I call rock and roll. So, if you know, if you like a journalist, it is because of the style, because of the particular style they have uh, in the newspapers, in the radio, whatever. But in terms of neutrality, veracity, internal coherence, grammar, all the technologies are perfect. So what they don't have is, I will say this, ethics or something like this, uh, human behavior. But if you consider that the, the first project was, a, was a, I have the name here, the Southern Metropolis Daily in China, and it has only two years, what we are facing is a real revolution. So, two big problems. The first one is data politics. So, uh, do you know what that does it mean? If you are um, a Che Guevara fan, usually it's Viva la Revolución, but here it's Viva la Resolución. Resolución means the quality of the information, so the pixels. So, data politics is about um, if we are considering all the static information, the robot will do the best. Statist, uh, static information means population, demographics, um, pol uh, behaviors, uh, voting, all, all the data stored by the government. But when you add dynamic information like social media, behavior, and something like this, the robot has more problem. So that's interesting. So data politics is also about if everything is um, consume it and share it through Google or Facebook, where's the journalist? It's at the end of the value chain. That's a big problem, very, very big problem. So, the second problem is the people. Do you know the, can you recognize this picture? Because people is doing things, new things, different things. This is the woman march against Donald Trump the day after the, the, the first day in, in office. The problem with the robots is that he, they are excellent analyzing previous behaviors, but they have no capacity to imagine future behaviors. So it's very interesting. So for, to cover this uh, information, you will need a journalist, not a robot. This is my opportunity. <laughs> so so final, final things about this. So uh, did you watch uh, Chernobyl? Yes, of course, yes. Did you see this Hannah Arendt quote, which is very famous, the quote, I mean, also Hannah Arendt. So the question with robots is that you will never know if this is trust or not. You will never know if Qatar government is paying for the information. You will have a lot of very uh, nice reports about financial statements, about uh, whatever you want, but you will never know that this uh, uh, 
reports are made by the robots and not by a journalist who has been there, who has checked the information. This is a big problem about trust. So, the second question is that the robot journalist is here. It's not, it's not, I'm not thinking about in the future in 10 years, no, it's right now here. We have uh, information here from, uh, for instance, in, in, in Newswire, we have uh, DPA in Germany, NAP in, in Netherlands, uh, STT in Finland, Associated Press, uh, uh, France Press in, in France, uh, in Austria, in Denmark, in Portugal, in Spain, uh, in everything, in any country, we have these robots doing their jobs. And right now, we don't know what is going to happen right now. The third question is about this information war. So we are not going to be able to know if this uh, content is developed by robots or, or is developed by the government or is developed by, uh, by journalists. Uh, consider right now Obama's video. If you have a population uh, without um, interest in information on what they have is only YouTube and something like this, do you think they are going to trust the government? They are going to trust YouTube? What do you think? Most of you, also me, of course, what we do is to, to share news using WhatsApp or something like this. We don't have time to check the information, who is in charge of this, who is this journalist, if you send me a video of Obama saying that we have to destroy uh, Russia today, say, oh, this is, is this true or not? So we don't have time. And this is happening right now. There's no clear, um, there's no clear public diplomacy, propaganda. So. And finally, this is a very interesting risk in terms of international relations, which is if we have a tool to promote hate speech, you cannot stop it. You will have, I will say you, about 20,000 pieces every week of hate speech. That's very, very particular, very uh, relevant because you cannot stop it. In terms of um, defense analysis, you can win, of course, you can stop, you can ban in YouTube a video, of course, but the cost of banning everything make it impossible. It's impossible. How can you ban a hate speech uh, YouTuber? You can't. Because after you ban it in YouTube, he will open a new different, in a new different platform and you can share it through WhatsApp. Nobody's going to know if you have this video or not in WhatsApp. So hate speech will be one of the, my view, more problematic issues in the, in the near future. So. I don't know if, if, if this is a very good idea or not, but this is more or less what is happening right now in, in, in artificial journalism, artificial intelligence, sorry, journalism and international relations. So, uh, more or less, that is. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Um, I actually have quite a few questions, but uh, um, I will stick to only the ones that uh, um, that are most interesting for me personally. Uh, first one relates to uh, how do you believe the artificial in, uh, intelligence will affect uh, investigative journalism, environmental journalism, uh, and journalism from war zones uh, mm -hmm. themselves. And the second one about uh, how do you think it will um, also affect uh, the, uh, in relation also to WikiLeaks, uh, how perhaps also robotization may, uh, programmers may program to hack into, for example, secret information and immediately leaking it as well? Mm -hmm. Okay. Regarding the first question about the environment or huge amount uh, of data, uh, I will say that data analysis is a, an opportunity because you will have 
access to more databases, to more data sets, and to more things. But the question is, you will need an investigative researcher, an investigative journalist, in order to discover some patterns. Of course, the machine will see you, uh, this is a pattern, you can follow this, or, but you need this, I will say, political behavior of what is happening. Can you connect this data with reality? Can you connect this data with some political activities or some economical activities, doesn't matter, some social activities? So I think there is opportunity, and considering WikiLeaks, um, in my view, there's no WikiLeaks if there's no journalism. Because we as a consumers, are you going to read all the WikiLeaks assets? You have no time, you have probably no interest. You can type some information, but you, you have no time for that. So in my view, WikiLeaks, and probably Snowden is a better example, you will always need a journalist to check the information. If you remember, WikiLeaks is no more than the, the information made by diplomatics. Do you think that these uh, American diplomatics are always fair or veritable or, or trustworthy? You will need a journalist just to check this information. So that's my, my point. Oh, thank you. Some more. One question. Are you human or robot? I hope I'm still a human. Um, I had a question because you said about robots that they are kind of not impartial and about uh, ethics, professional ethics. But at the same time, there is somebody who programs these robots. So we know that robots are also used in a good sense, if I can say robots, for example, our local Latvian news portals use internet. I think it's robots, or we can call programs, which uh, try to find uh, rude hate speech on internet comments. So in that sense, it helps actually to basically to identify hate speech among anonymous comments, to, 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 to delete such comments. So we see as a positive side how these technologies. So it's also my question, um, how far you can program the robot, so, so yeah. and, yeah. This is the big question right now in, in, in all this, in, in, in all this uh, issue, because right now the power is in programs, in programmers, and the people who is developing the technology. If you don't have a plurality of visions about the world in this uh, programming, what is going to happen is that they will show you one, only, only one uh, view of the world. There are some examples about this. For instance, um, we have robots and artificial intelligence to predict um, the crime. And do you know who is this uh, predicting people? Poor people, black people, I mean in America, of course. So you have um, a stereotype because you are a white man, a programmer from Silicon Valley, and you think that these black people in these uh, neighborhoods will be more probably they will commit um, any type of crime. There's a big ethical question here because it means that we are predictable and we are not uh, free to, to change our behavior. So I think that the, also if you, if you look at the European Commission activities, there is a, a interest, a growing interest in diversify the stems uh, of course, the most clear activity is to, to attract women to STEM, I mean science, technology, engineering, mathematics, because uh, with only about 25% of population, sorry, with 25% of women in these activities in Europe, it's maybe it's, it's not fair, maybe. And I'm thinking only in women, think about another minorities, another question which are not so clear, so visible, so so, um, uh, yes, so visible. So, so thank you. 